All right, uh, thank you, Tyler. So uh, go easy on me. I just uh, learned about this work about two days ago. So I'm gonna hopefully uh, do June justice. He does very good work. Uh, so uh, we're gonna be uh, talking about today an abrupt transition from a snowball state to a runaway greenhouse state. To point this somewhere in particular. Oh, I think. all right, and that's me, the presenter. So icy worlds are common. Uh, we see them in our own solar system, uh, Europa, Enceladus, Triton. Also, the Earth is believed to have entered into snowball phases in distant, in distant times in its past. And uh, we're going to be talking about how do you deglaciate these planets, but not via uh, buildup of CO2, as Jacob nicely described for us earlier, but rather via solar deglaciation, which for the sun is reasonable to occur because we know the sun brightens over time. Uh, so previous studies using complex uh, three-dimensional climate models have shown and predicted that you could solar deglaciate, like Shields 2014's work, uh, solar deglaciate a snowball state into a habitable world. Uh, so you do have a, the hysteresis that as Jade described, and you do, do need more uh, solar insulation to deglaciate the snowball as opposed to entering into it. But the end state, once the ice breaks apart, is typically predicted to be a habitable world. Uh, however, in this study, you'll see that assumptions made, particularly the ice model, uh, if we do a better tree, if June does a better treatment of the ice model, you actually see you would transition from a snowball state into an uninhabitably hot world. So uh, June and colleagues have used a community atmosphere model version three from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. It's a, a three-dimensional climate system model with atmos three-dimensional atmospheric circulation, radiative transfer, convection, precipitation, clouds, uh, boundary layer processes. Uh, you can put an uh, ice model, ocean models, a varying complexity. I don't th I think they use aqua planets here, so they pitch the land model. Uh, they assume an Earth-like atmospheric composition, bar of nitrogen, just a little bit of CO2, modern CO2, actually pre-industrial CO2, and then water vapor, which is variable uh, in the model, depending upon your surface temperature. Uh, resolution, 2.8 by 2.8 degree with 26 vertical levels. And the, the big uh, improvement they've made upon these previous studies is they've uh, improved the ice model. So uh, they use a 10-layer glacial ice model in order to determine when the snowball melting stellar flux threshold will occur. And uh, this ice, mo uh, ice model is laid on top of a 50 meter slab ocean model. Uh, I'm assuming with zero heat transport uh, for simplification purposes. So uh, the first key here is they use a higher resolution, higher vertical resolution to simulate the ice. So in this figure here from a paper of Dorian Abbott's in 2010, they took a single column version of the CAM sea ice model and they experiment with different vertical levels. So I think four, the solid black line, is the default. Uh, they also try two, and they also try 60. And what you have here is time and days of the diurnal cycle of temperature, surface air temperature, right above the sea ice. And they find that the default number of levels at four greatly exaggerates your diurnal cycle. And they call this in June's paper the melt ratcheting effect, that you, in these warm perturbations, you actually get some melting of the sea ice, and then you get an incomplete freeze during the nighttime. And this happens over and over again, and the net effect is you're melting more of the sea ice, and then you're refreezing at night, and it's an artificial effect due to a lack of vertical resolution in your sea ice model. So here, Dorian did uh, 60 vertical levels in the ice, and he finds the dashed line where these uh, the uh, the diurnal cycles and also seasonal cycles uh, are much lessened. So June used 10 vertical levels in his study. I assume that uh, he did some sensitivity tests and found that 10 was good enough compared to 60. And then uh, the other uh, difference between previous uh, studies of the sort was the type of uh, snow and ice albedos that you assume. So CAM, like most GCMs, have, a, uh, uh, a, have snow and ice albedos separated with visible and near IR. And these are, uh, I'm assuming, spectrally integrated quantities. So you have the snow, snow albedo is greater than the ice albedo. 
And uh, I think the, the take-home point from what June did was that, so in uh, Shields' uh, work in 2014, in the cold start case, if one assumes that you have a planet covered by sea ice, uh, you actually are drawing out a lower spectrally integrated albedo of about 0.5. When in reality, when we're thinking about a snowball planet that's been a snowball for billions of years, you have kilometer thick ice that's compacted layers of ice and snow and actually be much brighter than uh, 0.5. So for example, in CAM, if you specify sea ice, your spectrally integrated albedo is 0.5, snow is 0.8, but also if you assume a glacier type, which that's what we're really thinking about with snowball planets, everything is covered in like the, the whole planet's covered by the Greenland ice sheets. You actually should use a higher snow albedo or snow and ice albedo, closer to 0.8. Uh, so it's these two effects that are driving differences between past models of uh, solar driven deglaciation. Uh, so uh, with these improvements to the ice treatment, uh, June found that uh, for the Earth around the sun, Starting in the cold state, you would need a high, very high stellar flux to deglaciate, up to 1,800 watts per meter, per meter squared required to uh, melt an icy planet around G star. And this is about 400 watts per meter squared higher than that is found in Shields et al. 2014. And this plot, uh, June shows the uh, zonal mean temperature of, the, of a cold start snowball planet. Uh, as a function of latitude for different stellar fluxes, and you see they're all cold, cold, cold. So you get to 1800 watts per meter squared, and then you just start getting a little bit of melt around the equator. And this, once you start opening up the sea ice, you get, you open up the darker ocean, which is more uh, effective at absorbing solar radiation, and so on and so forth, and you can uh, melt the ice away. And uh, to kind of just, circle back on some of the reasons why uh, these are different than uh, the previous work. One is, uh, uh, one reason, as I mentioned, was the vertical sea ice uh, resolution, the number of layers. Two is the using a more appropriate surface albedo and not just assuming that your cold start is bare sea ice, but rather have a higher albedo, more typical of thick glacial ice. And then uh, in, as a general point, it's hard to get out of these uh, snowball, uh, snowball earths without uh, uh, resorting to greenhouse gases because you have very, uh, without resorting to CO2 uh, because you have a very weak uh, water vapor greenhouse effect shown here. These are the snowball cases. You have very little water vapor compared to the modern earth. So uh, June did a number of sensitivity tests uh, to ensure uh, uh, confidence in his results. So. On the y-axis, we have the stellar flux required to meet certain thresholds. The dots are the snowball melting threshold. And the lines here are various runaway and moist greenhouse limits from uh, 3D and 1D models uh, right here. So and then June did a bunch of sensitivity tests, different albedos, gravities, uh, cloud particle sizes, Topography, eccentricity, and hydrogen, clouds again, radius, radius, albedo, uh, and so on and so forth. And what you generally see here is that except if the albedo is specified to be unreasonably low, perhaps this is a, would be an albedo of 0.4 for the glacial ice would be a dirty snowball, which is a, a previous idea of how you might be able to deglaciate a snowball. But the majority of these cases are close to or even higher than these moist and runaway greenhouse limits. So just to melt the snowball, you need enough stellar flux to that would trigger a moist and runaway greenhouse upon deglaciation of the planet. Uh, so June also tried this again with F stars and K stars. I should mention all these are rapidly rotating planets. Uh, none of these are synchronously or slow rotating. And for the F star planet, as one would expect, you need more stellar flux to deglaciate. Uh, because the stellar spectrum is bluer and thus is, uh, uh, their light is reflected more efficiently by the uh, snow and ice. And the opposite is true of the K-star case. So in the K-star case, you need less uh, stellar flux because the stellar spectrum is a little redder, it's more uh, effectively absorbed by the ice. So this uh, abrupt transition from snowball to a moisture runaway greenhouse does not occur in the K-star case. You can actually recover stable climates uh, 
the melt thresholds are below uh, the runaway limits. Uh, so uh, here we have uh, transient plots, uh, time series plots of his uh, melt simulations around FG and K stars. So uh, surface temperature over here, sea ice coverage over here. So first for the K star case, uh, upon deglaciation, it does stabilize into a temperate climate. However, for the uh, F and the G star case, all the ice melts in a short time frame, and then the climate ends up uh, running away. Uh, and you can see that clearly as well from uh, a plot of outgoing long wave radiation absorbed solar radiation. This is a uh, theoretical limiting curve for the outgoing long wave radiation. So just to deglaciate a, a snowball F and G star planet, you need enough solar absorbed radiation that's beyond the OLR limit for a runaway. So these planets can never recover. They can never stabilize uh, upon de after deglaciation. And that's not true for the K-star case. For the K-star case, uh, a lesser amount of stellar flux is needed to melt the ice. And then the top plot shows uh, H2O volume mixing ratio in the stratosphere. And it's just showing that for the uh, G and the F-star case, you end up with a enough water vapor in the upper atmosphere that you'd end up losing, even if these simulations didn't terminally go to a uh, you know, 1600 K uh, full terminal runaway state, even if they sit theoretically stabilize somewhere at a hotter temperature, you'd still lose all your water to space for the moist greenhouse processes. Uh, so to conclude, uh, there's an abrupt transition from a snowball state to a moist or runaway greenhouse state as found in June simulations due to an improved treatment of uh, sea ice and glacial ice. And so this, this conclusion, uh, conclusion applies to F and G star systems, places like Europa, Enceladus, Ganymede, planets having low greenhouse gas concentrations and inactive carbon silicate cycling, uh, super Earths, uh, if they're lithospheres or in the stagnant lid regime. And then these conclusions do not apply to M and K star systems because the redder spectra lower the effective uh, sea ice and snow albedos. And also carbon uh, doesn't apply to Earth with an active carbon silicate cycling because we get processes that occur as uh, Jacob described in his talk earlier today. So uh, thank you. Uh, and I guess I'll take questions, but uh, any answers are expressly my own and don't reflect those of the authors necessarily. <laughs> Uh, any questions? Yes, Charlie? I'm, I'm not sure you know the answers, but when he says it doesn't apply to the Earth because of an active carbonate silicate cycle, mm -hmm. how active? I, yeah, I can't answer that, but you know, enough to, as Jacob described the process with CO2, that you'd have these blips of warming uh, and you wouldn't enter a runaway. But, yeah. Yes. Right, right, right. Yeah, the idea is the CO2 would accumulate, you deglaciate, and then CO2 would be drawn back down and you'd break out of the hysteresis and now you'd have a warm planet. So. No, he did not. That's the assumption. He just has, a, I think, 300 ppm of CO2. That's it. All right, well, let's give Eric another round of applause, especially for doing someone else's talk.